something? Yes. Scott, I can't, I cannot hear this morning. Well, I, 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 but I will pitch myself up. I'll do my best. So uh, hmm. they're not going to be talking. You, can you hear Mary, do you think, if you can't? I could. Okay. Mary, are you going to start out reading? Uh, I, I was going to, I was going to say where we left off. Can she hear us or can you, can um, you increase the volume? Can you hear, you can't yes. hear, okay. Is that enough, everybody else? No, no. no. Okay. So where we left off, first of all, next week, um, Sunday is Christmas Eve, but it's Christmas Eve morning. So our intention is to have Sunday school, but it will, we will take one week break from Matthew and, and have a Christmas um, Sunday school. And so we, we will still meet understanding a lot of you might be traveling in and out and, but we'll also send it out immediately afterwards. So you can share it with your family or watch it yourself um, on the Christmas holidays. And then we will, um, we will meet probably, I, I don't know, I guess we're going to meet January 31st, which will be Christmas Eve. I mean, New Year's Eve morning. It's sort of, funny this year, but anyhow, it's every year is a challenge. So anyhow, that's our plan and we will do it. And whoever shows up understanding people are in different places in the next two weeks. So um, with that, where we left off, we are um, on the 22nd week of studying Matthew. And there are five sections in Matthews and, the, and we're in the fifth section and it's chapters 21 through 25. And um, Matthew's theme with these chapters is the clash of the two kingdoms. And um, Jesus has come to Jerusalem for his last time. It is Passover. Um, he, he's in the temple courts and he is talking to the chief priests and the elders. And uh, we're at a, a section of the um, uh Matthew, where he has three parables. We did the first one last week, and the first parable was a parable of the two sons, and um, and it led to, uh, and it was answering the question about uh, basically John the Baptist, um, whether whether the um, chief priests and elders believed in John the Baptist. And Scott, do you want to say something before we start on chapter twenty one, verse thirty three? No, I think keep in mind, he's talking directly to the Pharisees, to the leaders now. And even when he uses parables, these are not the kind of parables that are intended to not be understood by them. He's being very direct. And just in case they don't get the point, he then tells them what is meant by it. Uh, and they they realize that the things he's saying about them are pretty harsh and they're, they're getting angrier by the minute, but what he's done, uh, they come in with their authority demanding some explanation and he's turned everything around. They're now essentially the, the students and he's the teacher and he holds them like that. He just goes from one thing to another and they're left sort of speechless and powerless uh, and, and it's a it's an amazing it's an amazing scene that's going on here. Matthew is is sharing with us a very very important development, uh, and it's real clear what's going on. There are going to be this morning a couple other ones. Some of my really favorite stories, uh, the 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 one about rendered unto Caesar. I think you may find you haven't been told some pretty important things, but this is a this is an important section. This is really the setup for the beginning of them having him killed. So we're on Matthew chapter twenty one, verses thirty three, uh, starting at verse thirty three, and this is the second parable that he is telling the chief priests um, and the Pharisees. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he rented it out to some tenants and went away on a journey. When the harvest time drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to, to collect his share of the fruit. But the tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, 
and stoned a third. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first group, but the tenants did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard returns, what will he do with those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched inn, they replied, and will rent out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the fruit at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone? This is from the Lord, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they knew that Jesus was speaking about them. Although they wanted to arrest him, they were afraid of the crowds because the people regarded him as a prophet. So this episode, uh, let, me, let me show you some amazing things about this episode. The, for starters, the obvious is the story itself. And, and he tells this story about a vineyard owner uh, that, that plants, uh, he put a wall around it, dug a wine press, and built a tower, right? Now, this is Israel itself. He put a wall around it. He, he built a wine press. He, he built a tower. In other words, they didn't build the nation of Israel. God did. And in the beginning of this parable, they're going to realize what's being said. But I want to read something to you. If you have those scriptures in front of you that we just read, this comes from Isaiah. It's Isaiah 5. And Isaiah tends to be bold enough to bring word directly from God and say, thus saith the Lord, right? But listen to this at the beginning of Isaiah 5. I will sing for my beloved a song of his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it up and cleared the stones and planted the finest vines. He built a watchtower in the middle and dug out a wine press as well. Does that sound just like the beginning of this parable? It's because it is. And we tell you often that close to half of the New Testament are references to Old Testament. You can't be just, we had someone one time that got sort of angry about being a, a, a New Testament Christian. You, you really can't because so much is related to and steeped in the Old Testament stuff. Let me go ahead with Isaiah 5 just for a minute, and we'll get back to, to today's, you know, out of Matthew. But at the end of Isaiah 5, he actually says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Okay? In Isaiah, it, 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 it is a preview of what Jesus is talking about. And it actually says that, that God built the, the, the vineyard. He built the tower. He built the wine press. He put a wall around it. Jesus uses those words. And at the end of Isaiah 5, you, you read, he says, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So we're not just making this up. We've been told that what Jesus is talking about is the nation of Israel. And he's told the Pharisees, look, God built this. You didn't. And he handed over to you something precious, something that was ready made. And all you had to do was harvest the fruit, take care of it and harvest the fruit. And then he tells this story about how the, the vineyard owner, the landowner, 
comes to collect his share. He's put these people in charge of his vineyard, this beautiful place that he set up, and he comes to collect his share of the harvest. And they actually, he sends people and they mistreat them, abuse them, torture them, jail them. And these are the prophets. And we have records of that. The prophets get sent and they mistreat them. And then he sends more and they're actually, some of them are even killed. And, and we talk about that. It's not just supposition. We have the exact reference in the prophecies from the Old Testament. And it comes right out and says so. So he tells this story about this vineyard owner, and they haven't put it together yet. And he says that they, they mistreated and even killed some of the, the, his servants. So he sends his son. He says, surely, surely they'll respect my son. And the, the, you know, the wicked tenants, greedy, they say, hey, if, if we kill the heir, we can have this inheritance for ourselves for nothing. And the leaders, the Pharisees hear this, and they just get angry. Because see, from their point of view, they can relate to this landowner, the rich person, because that's who they are. And so if they had tenants who treated them this way, they'd want them run off, maybe even killed, right? So they get very irate. And, and you know, J Jesus says, what should be done to these tenants? And they say, well, those wretches should come to a wretched end. And, and the landowner should get new tenants who will take care of things and who will give the landowner his share of the harvest. They came to the right conclusion they just didn't realize it was them. And that's what I mentioned last week. This is like when Nathan comes to David and tells him that story. David gets all irate and says, that man should die. And Nathan says, that man is you. Well, in this case, Jesus tells this parable and, and they can see it. Isn't that the way, though? We can, we can often see the flaws in other people not so much in ourselves. So they can see what these people, these wicked tenants have done. And then he turns around and says, that's exactly what you've done. This is a very distracting morning, isn't it? The dog is barking and, were you want to say something? Yeah, I want to ask you, now, what's the time reference in the time of Isaiah? Has the uh, split of the, the 12 tribes already occurred? I should know this, and I'm not gonna shoot from the hip. Uh, yeah, I believe, I believe. He said, what's the time reference in Isaiah has the split of the two kingdoms? And I would say, yes, I'm, I'm just awfully sure that, that is, that's happened, that the southern kingdom, Judah, uh, the northern kingdom, that happens fairly early on. But I'm not positive. I, I'm just not going to shoot from the end, Mario. I should yeah, know. Because, I mean, like you say, when you, when you, when you say that he basically blurs it out in plain English uh, in Isaiah 5, 7, where it says, this vineyard is Israel. Um, and towards the end it says, and uh, the men of Judah are his planting or whatever. And so I'm thinking, so if this happened before the split, that's even more of a, a you know, a prophecy of who, who's, who's going to be the lineage and all that good stuff, you know? It's, it's kind of understood through here that Isaiah... <clears throat> And this happens with prophecy. Often it, there, there are kind of two references. There's a present day and there's a future. And I don't know why it's like that, but it, it is. And it happens so often that it's pretty well understood. But this area, Isaiah, it, it's, it's very well accepted that this is prophecy, that this is going to come in the future. But there's also something going on in the kingdom right then. That, that it applies to. But you can definitely see that Jesus takes it. Even if it wasn't prophetic, Jesus says, look what happened before. And Israel got taken away from the people who didn't take care of it. And now I'm telling you Pharisees, the same thing's going to happen to you. And that's really the message. He tells them point blank. The Pharisees uh, were, were all upset. They were angry. Uh, and he says, 
Let me see if I can. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Is that in Matthew? Isaiah? That's in Matthew. That starts. And at, it does say, Scott, it does say that the book of Isaiah was spoken in a time where the kingdom was divided. It had already Israel spread. in the north and Judah in the south. I was pretty sure of it. And that's why he references Judah and not all of Israel. But uh, the, the point is that, that, that Jesus, in doing this, sort of sets the Pharisees up with a mirror so they see themselves. And he uses these words, this exact thing from Isaiah. And Isaiah tells us that the vineyard is the kingdom of Israel. So in Jesus' parable, they finally recognize it. And, and he's just telling them point blank, the kingdom's going to be taken away from you and given to other people. And, and that's a, I mean, that's a very harsh thing for them to, to have to come to grips with. Uh, and the last part of that, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they knew he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds because the people regarded him as a prophet. And, and of course, we're supposed to see that they do not regard him as a prophet, but they see him as having influence over the people and they're, they're afraid of the people. The other, the other thing in verse 42, Jesus once again um, references Psalm 118 and right before um right before or right after this section is the section about Hosanna. Uh, maybe you can articulate it better than I, Scott. Well, yeah, I mean, this, this section that Matthew brings ties so many things together that Hosanna is direct quote from Psalm 118. The point he, there, was that, go ahead. When he entered, so a couple of chapters back, when Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time, you remember the crowds were gathered and they were putting the palm branches down and they were quoting from 118. And so all of these people, some of the things that we forget, they know Psalm 118. And so here Jesus is saying, remember just a couple of days ago, this was happening and they were quoting 118. Let me let me quote a little bit more of 118, basically, he's telling them. Yeah, the stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone is in Psalm 118. And he references that about the, the stone, that that's him. The stone the builders rejected is him. Uh, and, and so he's tying together prophecy and he's tying together what's about to happen to them. I mean, he's just made a pronouncement. And you also see in the parable of the vineyard about first sending servants. And it's, I think, easy to recognize that's the prophets. But then he says that the landowner, the vineyard owner, sent his son. Clearly, he's saying, that's me. And you reject me. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a problem for you. Um, there are people, in fact, I read this week, a, a pretty well-known sort of pastor, uh, online and TV kind of guy. They, they will say that, that Jesus didn't even think he was divine. He didn't think he was the actual son of God. And yet you see in this parable, you see what he's telling them that the landowner sent his son and they killed him. It's prophetic, but he knows what's about to happen. He's in Jerusalem for the last time. He's in Jerusalem days ahead of the crucifixion. So this brings, Matthew has brought to us a whole lot of things together in, in these stories. Uh, and in that one section that I've, I read you uh, in Isaiah, where Isaiah says to the to the eunuchs, don't let don't let any of you say that that I I'm going to be cut off to the outsiders, the the people who aren't Jews. Don't say that God is going to cut me off from His people because I'm not a Jew. 
to the eunuchs, he'll give an inheritance better than that of sons and daughters. And to the, the foreigners that keep his statutes, uh, they'll, you know, they'll become his children, basically, is what he's saying. But the, the point here is this, is, this is what is going on right now. And that section in Isaiah, to this day, there are synagogues where they just don't read that chapter in Isaiah. They just won't have anything to do with it. They know what's being said about them. When he references Isaiah, they know that what he's saying is, you people are about to be cut off. You've, you've messed up. Uh, th this one section is pretty amazing. We got to move on. I think you get the idea. There are a lot of things coming together in this one series of parables. So once again, no chapters and verses when this was originally written. And if you were in a church and someone was reading the next session, it starts with once again. And if you don't know what once again refers to, once again refers to the fact that Jesus is still talking to the chief priests and elders, and he's going to give a third parable. So I'm in Matthew 22. Once again, Jesus spoke to them in parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to call those he had invited to the banquet, but they refused to come. Again, he sent other servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been killed and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went away one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged, and he sent his troops to destroy those murderers and burnt their city. Then he said to the servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited were not worthy. Go, for, there, go therefore to the crossroads and invite to the banquet as many as you can find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered everyone they could find, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he spotted a man who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? But the man was speechless. Then the king told the servants, tie him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of feet. For many are called, but few are chosen. So this is so similar, the first part of this. The, the really only difficult part of this is the last little bit. I mean, he tells this about the, the wealthy man who's throwing a wedding feast for his son. And, and the weddings are supposed to be a, a time of celebration. Jesus is identifying himself as the bridegroom. You will see him described that way numerous times. And so, you know, he tells this story and the ones that he invited just didn't come to the feast. That's clearly the, the Jews, the Jewish leaders. He invited them. They ignored the call. And he calls them again. And, you know, you see, once again, they mistreat people. And so he finally says, you know, it's time now. The, the, the animals are slaughtered. The food is ready. The celebration is here. Jesus is here. It's time. And, and the celebration is not going to get put, put off. He sends servants out and says, just go call everybody else, everyone you can find. And here's that message again. This is like Isaiah that I keep coming back to. It's going to be, my house will be a house of prayer for all people, for all the nations, for the Gentiles. And he says, this is happening even as we speak. This is starting to happen. The bridegroom is here. The feast is ready. And he's telling these people that have been invited, you didn't answer the call. You're no longer invited. We're going to go, you know, I'm going to go bring people who do want to come. And then we come to this last piece. And, and it's about among these people show up from off the streets. And there's lots of them. 
and there's one who's not dressed for a wedding feast. And he says, why aren't you dressed for a wedding feast? And the guy is just speechless. He's just, I, I, I don't know. And he tells his servants to bind the man and throw him into the outer darkness. First of all, you have to understand, this is not about how we dress when we come to church, mm -hmm. right? This is not about dressing up to come to church. We went to a church one time and a guy was, he came in shorts. And I, again, my, it's not even sense of humor. I told him, it's Rockport. I said, I wish I could do that. It was beaten into me when I was a kid so bad. There is no way that I could make myself come in shorts. But I think it's pretty cool that you do. Uh, and I think he thought that I was getting him told and I never saw him again. And I feel really bad for opening my mouth. This is not about how we dress. We certainly should be respectful. Certainly as we learn more, we understand that there are ways of showing respect that we should probably participate in. This is not about clothing. And you notice at the end where he says, having bound and thrown into the outer darkness, this isn't about a wedding, a real wedding. Someone comes to the a wedding not dressed right, you may boot them out the door, but you don't bind them and shove them into the outer darkness. So this is a, a metaphor for something else. There's a place where Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, am I going to recognize? Some of them I'm going to look at and say, I never knew you. You never knew me. So there are people who are being, who will be called as part of this. The, the Jewish hierarchy is a thing of the past. New people, Gentiles, people off the streets are going to be called. But some people are going to come just hang out for the, you know, see what the party's all about. And he says, just like he says in that other, you know, that other section, I'm going to say, I never knew you. And he says, they're going to be bound and cast into the outer darkness. You're going to be in the same boat as these Pharisees and Sadducees who didn't answer the call. Just because you happen to be in the room doesn't mean that you answered the call. That's all that is. I think it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Why would he tell that to them? I think part of this is probably instruction for us down the road. I mean, he's setting the stage for how the kingdom of God is going to develop after he's crucified and dies and is resurrected. He's telling us how it's going to go. It, it, this Matthew is just packing an awful lot in. Scott, do you think when he makes this analogy of this guy who's not wearing a proper wedding attire. It, 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 <clears throat> like you say, it's got nothing to do with clothes, but he's just signaling out that he's not maybe uh, holding to his statutes, his ordinances, his commandments, you know? Because, I mean, why, why would he use, you know, the clothing as to somehow or other say, he's an infidel, okay? Something like that. Uh, I don't why do why do people wear the why did they would they have worn fancy clothing to the wedding celebration? Well, first of all, in the, in the, before it says, go get people from the street, good and bad. So you cannot imagine that anybody bad is going to be dressed like he's ready for a wedding attire. You see what I'm saying? True. So so that sort of throws my white track line off already. And so, okay, all right, but you, I know these guys blew you off of, of your wedding and your son and your preparation and all that. He says, we're still going to have a party anyway. We're going to just go get people in here. But he makes a point of saying good and bad. And so then he signals out this person who didn't come with a proper wedding attire. So I'm trying to follow what you're saying. I'm trying to think, is this an analogy or a parable to say that this guy stood out because he maybe wasn't following, so this is a parable, you know, that, that he's not following Jesus's, you know, ways of being. And so I'll go back to the question I was asking, why did people dress up for a wedding feast like this in that time? Why, why would, the, in, the, in the, the parable, it's understood that even people off the street would have taken time to dress up because they're there 
to recognize and celebrate the bridegroom. And so there are people who will be called Gentiles who are there to celebrate the bridegroom. They, they come in, they believe, they accept. This other person apparently does not. I, I'll go to an example. I've never used that with, with all of you, but you know the, the musician uh, who called him, he was named, he called himself Prince. You know, Prince, the, the, yeah, yeah. the artist. Yeah. And later he changed his name to a symbol. That's kind of dumb. But, but Prince says, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I mean, he, he proclaims it. He says so. And I know people back, he's dead now, but they looked at his lifestyle and they said, he can't be because look at how he behaves. And then he died of, a, of an overdose and they go, see, all right, this is one of those things that people do, that Christians do, that I, I am, you know, kind of adamant about. What makes someone a believer is saying that they are and believing. If they have behaviors left over that are, that, you know, given time, we're changed. It's a walk. Do, do, when it says people good and bad, apparently some of the, and I'm going to put quotes around this, the bad people took the time to dress themselves up for the feast, didn't they? To celebrate the bridegroom. This one guy stands out as someone who didn't, someone who's there for some other reason. We're told in the, the story about the wheat and the tares, you know, somehow these weeds got mixed in with the wheat. Do you want us to go pull them up? And he says, no, if you do that, you might damage the wheat. Wait until the end. And at the end, I'll sort everything out. So this person that Jesus is talking about, and it's worth us talking about because of Prince, for one, where people think that it's their right to judge whether or not he's a believer because of either his lifestyle or the fact that he dies of, a, of an overdose. Certainly, I think you could make a case that maybe he doesn't represent the kingdom well, but that's not what we're talking about here. So I think that this person Jesus talks about is a person who's called and a person who comes towards him, but doesn't come prepared to celebrate the bridegroom, doesn't come prepared to accept the Messiah. That's what I think. And I think but, that, yes, sir. But Scott, it's, it's a little harsh. It's a lot harsh. I mean, the guy's out there in the crossroads. He doesn't even know the, the king's bridegroom. He gets a call from the king's servants, layer number two. You couldn't come to the wedding. And he goes, it sort of parallels the, the two sons about, yes, I'm going to do the work and then do it. So this guy comes in the spare of the moment. The food is ready. It, it's a time consequence. He gets called in the bottom of the night. Do I go or do I not go? I got an invitation from the king himself. I've got to go. Um, he doesn't even know if he's ready or not. He's just going to try to celebrate. So he shows up and then he gets thrown out because he's not in proper attire, which is not the clothing, it's a preparation. He didn't, unless he was somehow enlightened that all this reading by the scribes and the Pharisees gave him the shot to have the opportunity to say that's God. That all, I, all I can tell you is that even in this story, even in this parable, it's obvious that the other, I mean, they know that this is a wedding celebration. They know what you're supposed to do. And so you're kind of inventing a guy that we're not told about. This one apparently should have known because everyone else did. And, and they take the time to, to prepare themselves and remember what he's teaching. He's teaching about people, outsiders, Gentiles, prostitutes, tax collectors who are being called, who are looking at him and saying, yes, I believe this is the Messiah. And what this portion of it is, is people who come along for the ride, not even thinking about it, 
they don't they don't believe they don't even think about it and and he even gives them a chance doesn't he, he says what are you doing here if if you're not here for a, for a wedding celebration what are you doing here if you're not here to celebrate the messiah and believe the messiah and the guy goes uh i don't know what i'm doing here i got to be somewhere so is it harsh it is harsh and and i guess we need to hear that it's harsh and yet at the same time there apparently is an expectation that he received a message that he did not wow. everyone else did everyone else found a way and and in the it, you know what's being talked about it's being talked about these others who are going to be called and he says some are called and they just they just don't come believing so let me get you back to Isaiah Yes. Uh, let, let the blind see, let the deaf hear, you know. But this guy, I mean, I sympathize with him. At the bottom of the night, I mean, I go because the king ordered me to go, and then I didn't make the cut because of. Well, it's not just making the cut, though. We don't make the cut. This is the work gets done here in just a couple of chapters when he winds up allowing himself to be sacrificed to be crucified the work is done by him and the fact is saying that i i identify with him when i hear the story of the prodigal son you know the one who stayed home i'm arrogant enough to see myself in that like as if i stayed home and was a good boy and i wasn't i'm arrogant enough to see in 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 that good son myself and feel that same thing it doesn't seem fair that this guy gets a party when he did all this stuff and this guy doesn't gene what you're talking about is exactly like the workers that, that get hired at five o'clock in the evening and get the same reward it, it's exactly the same thing do i do i sympathize with this guy sure but i would submit that if we sympathize with this guy enough we're supposed to be wise enough to pick up on the fact that we should probably tell him. Probably somebody that sympathizes should say, hey, you know, this is what's going on here. This is not a social club. This is about the Messiah. That's what he's describing. In the wedding feast, I don't know, when he showed up at the door and, and clearly was just there, you know, the cause Maybe somebody should have mentioned it to him. I don't know. You're getting off into things that I'm, you know, I mean, they, but is it harsh? Yeah. And, and sadly, it can be a little harsh sounding, but we know the answer to this. But is that any more harsh than to say, you're going to lose the, sh the shot that you had at the beginning because you're not believing in me, which is what he told the Pharisees and so How harsh is that? I don't know. They, I mean, that's very harsh. They've been, they've been given leadership over, you know, the, the, the entire worship of Yahweh. And when his son comes, when the, the fruition of everything they've been promised comes, they're so wrapped up in politics and making money, they didn't want to hear about it. If they had known he was Messiah, I don't think they would have cared. So yes, it's harsh. What they're being told is harsh. This story can be harsh. I, I would say that if you know what the wedding celebration is about, you know what to do. And if you do and somebody else doesn't, maybe it's our job to tell them. So, so is this touching the boundaries of predestination? Oh, I'm not touching the boundaries of predestination. Okay. You, you're free to, but I'm not. I'm not touching those boundaries. Um, another another time, we'll we'll pick it up. No Many are called, or few, and few are chosen. And and yes, it, it, people do use this and touch the boundaries of predestination, but not this morning. Because I'm. So can I go on with um, verse 15? Please do, because I love this next story. I know. I was. I was going to say this is one of Scott's favorite stories. Then the Pharisees went out and conspired to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are honest and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You seek favor from no one because you pay no attention to external appearance. So tell us, what do you think? 
is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil intent and said, you hypocrites, why are you testing me? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Whose image is this, he asked, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they answered. So Jesus told them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And, then, and when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. All right. So you've heard this story. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. By the time we're done, I would hope that some of you are going to be asking yourselves, wait a minute, how come nobody ever told me this part? So it says that the Pharisees come and they're going to trap him in his own words. What words are those? He's just been telling them that um, the kingdom is going to be given to these lowly, low life tax collectors, prostitutes, all these other people. And so they're going to trap him with those words. So look how they start this sort of flattery. Uh, the Pharisees come to trap him in his words, and they, they sent their disciples along with the Herodians. Herod, you all know Herod. Yes. And, and so they bring court people, representatives of Herod. Why would they do that? because this is a trap and they want witnesses. They want someone from Herod there. When Jesus gets trapped, they're gonna be able to send word back to Herod and they're gonna be able to send word back to, to Caesar. And they, we've got him, we're gonna trap him. And so they're gonna trap him with his own words and they start out with this flattery, teacher, rabbi, we know you're honest and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. We know this sounds like something from, from Shakespeare, from Julius Caesar. I mean, it's kind of, so we know, we know you're an honest man. We all know that Brutus is an honest man. Uh, that's, by the way, where Shakespeare got this. Uh, he said, you seek favor from no one. You don't care about anybody's opinion of you. You just tell the truth, Right. It says, because you pay no attention to external appearance. <laughs> That's what he's been saying, that these lowly people are going to inherit the kingdom of God. They don't like it, but they go, okay, if that's the truth, here you go. How are you going to deal with this? So tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? The Jews resent, the common people resent the taxation of Rome violently. There are a lot of them that want to overthrow Rome. They always have this dream. And in their dream, the Messiah is going to come and liberate them from Rome or any other oppressor. And one of the things it's going to liberate them from is paying taxes to Caesar. So you got the, you got the picture. You see what they're up to. And what they know is the common people, the ones that it keeps saying they're afraid of, they're united on one thing. They hate Rome and they hate paying taxes. And in their mind, it's not even legal for good Jews to be paying taxes to these Gentile Romans. And the Pharisees know it. So is it legal? And what they're thinking is, if he says, no, it's not legal, they're going to report him to Caesar they're going to report him to Herod, and he's in trouble. I mean, he's in jail at the very least. But if he says, yes, it is legal, the people are going to reject him. The people are going to say, oh, now you're taking the road. Does that sound like modern-day politics? Does that sound like pop? Oh, now you're supporting the, the bad guys, really? We don't want you. We're going to boycott you. That's what they're planning on, Okay. Jesus knew their evil intent and says, you hypocrites, remember that. Why are you testing me? He knows what they're up to. He says, show me now the coin used for the tax. And somebody brings out a denarius. The denarius is literally Herod's coinage. Herod 
has the raw silver. This is the silver denarius. Herod has raw silver and he has it minted. He has it stamped and it has his image on one side, generally the eagle of Rome on the backside, but it has his face on it. And he says, bring me one of the coins. Somebody bring me, bring me a Roman coin. And they bring this thing up and it's got a picture, and picture right there of Herod on it. Now, what most of you probably don't know is or haven't thought of, it's prohibited for Jews to have graven images they're not allowed to have statues or pictures or coins with pictures of people on it because it's a form of idolatry. It's setting some person up as being worshipped. You know the, the saying, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be? Yes. That's what this, and so they're prohibited by Jewish law from even possessing a coin with Herod's picture on it anybody's picture on it. The Jews fight at times over their own coins, whether or not put things like a a, a wheat sheaf on it, because some say that's a graven image. This is serious business with them. There is no doubt that having the coin with Herod's or with Caesar's picture on it is prohibited. And, And I always have this image now that at the point that he asked, Uh, whose image is on that coin? Some of them in the audience were smart enough to go, oh, geez, we're, we're, we're blown. They knew what, I mean, some of them had to have figured it out. Whose image is on there? Caesar. They're not even supposed to have that coin. They're supposed to be good Jews. They're the leaders, right? They know better than that. They're in bed with the Romans. They're doing business with the Romans. Unless you, you, you think, well, but they pay the tax in a denarius. It's a denarius value. They're money changers. It's a long story. But the point is, he sets them up. He says, whose picture is on there? Caesar. He says, then give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Now, I grew up being told this story. And, and everyone I know thought, well, that was a clever thing. You know, that's a clever thing to say. But what does it mean? Does that mean give the government half your money, give the church the other half, and you're left with nothing? What does it even mean? This money literally belongs to Caesar. It's his money. He lets people use it. He pays the troops in coins with his face on it. So he says, you know, you're asking me, is it legal to, to pay a denarius to Caesar, it's Caesar's denarius. <clears throat> give it to him, but give God what belongs to God. And that would include not having these graven images of Julius Caesar. And, and it's, a, it's, it's a much more clever trap, if you will, than what we were led to believe. And, he's, and so he says, uh, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. See, if they make a big issue of this, the people that they're afraid of are going to pick up on the fact you've been getting paid in Roman coins. You're, you're in business with the people we hate. So they're trying to say, is it legal to pay taxes to them? And I would say back is it legal to do business with them? Are you the good guys who have been doing enough business that you just happen to have some Caesar coinage laying around? This was a, a, a masterful, brilliant thing to do. And it says they realized, oh, we're kind of we're kind up a creek. And they just left. I got nothing more. Do you read a difference in is it lawful? As opposed to, is it legal? Uh-huh. In this, is it lawful uh, to pay taxes to Caesar? Are they talking about Jewish law? It's Jewish law. That's where I'm going. Or certainly, certainly about, under Roman law. Obviously, lawful in the legal sense. That coin belongs to to Caesar anyway. What what he knows and what they know <laughs> is that the people don't want to pay tax money to Caesar, to the Romans. And they have fallen back on Jewish law to say, we shouldn't be doing this. It's not even lawful under 
Old Testament under Jewish law for us to do it. That's what they know, and that's what's being talked about. Mary, do we have time to go on? You muted her. Oh my. There you God. go. No, it's nine fifty nine. Okay. I thought you said that Daenerys had Herod's picture. I did. I made a mistake. A couple of times I said Caesar, and a couple of times I said Herod. It's Caesar's picture, as he says, whose picture is on there, and, and, and they say Caesar. Bring that up today. So when, let's say back in the day, before Roman occupation, how did the, the Jews conduct business? What 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 modality of of exchange that they had or was it just cows for pigs or they did barter but i tried to mention this i tried to bring it up they they had coins the jews had coins well, and th they literally fought with each other over whether they could have any sort of images wow. on their coins and and one of the big fights they got into i just happened to remember was you know the the typical sheaf of wheat like is on an old penny right some of them wanted to put wheat decoration, and they had major fights among themselves. They tried to put trees at times on them, and they fought. Yes, sir. Could it be like um, the, the piece of silver that Judas got, just pieces of silver? Could it be like the piece of silver that Judas got? I would, I would, if there were any way to do it, I would wager a small sum that the coins Judas got paid with had Caesar's face on them, that they were Roman coins. The Romans used Roman coins. The Romans didn't want anything to do with any nasty Jewish coins. This is why there were money changers in the temple courts. It's exactly why. Uh, but yeah, I would say that, that Judas probably got paid and those were the silver cords. They, they were denarii. Uh, if you read ahead, I'll mention real quickly, the next section talks about the Pharisees have had their shot. Now the Sadducees are going to come. And I'll just give you one little preview. Sadducees don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe there's a heaven they don't believe any, there's anything after we die. And the, the Sadducees almost exclusively were priests. They were wealthy and they were the actual priest. Levites are sort of like servants in the temple. The priests are a different group. And that's by and large, the Sadducees. And they don't even believe there's an afterlife. So if you read the next section, Keep that in mind, and you're going to read what they say, and you're going to go, hey, wait a minute. What are they talking about? A lot of stuff going on. Okay, it's time. I know that. <laughs> and I got baby. <laughs> oh, you sure do. And I come home. <laughs> we search for understanding. We, we look for you and for your will and for your meaning. And we're limited at times. We're displeased with the message. At times, we worry about the message, but we seek. Reward us. We're told that if we seek, we find. If we knock, the door is opened. We're here. We knock. Bring us that understanding. Grant us that that we're here to find. We understand the main thing above all else is that when you chose to send your son among us as one of us, it started something new, something different that you had planned for such a long time. And it includes us millennia later. The one thing I ask this week is that as we go into the time where we celebrate, we call Christmas, that you look down, you find us seeking, and you remind us that this was a gift, it was planned, and that we are blessed to be part of it. Amen. Amen.
Hi, Finley. Hi, Finley. Say hi. You see Atticus? You see Atticus? That I stayed up for my nap, and now it's time for me to go to nap nap time. Cheryl, sorry, Sherry, where's your dad? Tied in there somewhere. He's on. He's on a phone. His his computer wouldn't work today. He was oh, having okay. bad. Oh, that's bad the one I see down there. All right. Well, Jack, it's good to see the little image of your phone with us. <laughs> and and if you guys weren't on, try to join us next Sunday morning. And if you're um, not available, we will. Um, we will take it right after. Okay, there we go. Bye bye. Thank you guys. It's good to see you all. See you guys later. Mary. I will see you guys later. Bye bye.